Okay, off we go. So last time we were talking about change of variables. Let me just hit the highlights real quick um, on that. Uh, so uh, the big first idea was that we're going to reinterpret the substitution rule as an equation, not as a method, not as a strategy, right, but as an actual equation, equating two integrals that, in fact, are always equal. Um, and the aspects of this that I wanted to uh, point to in particular are, first of all, this idea of a pullback. That if the function is going that way, then the expressions go the opposite way. Expressions pull backwards through functions. Points go forward, expressions go backwards. Right? So that's going to be an important aspect of what we're going to be doing. Uh, the other thing is, in looking at how big the uh, dx is and realizing that it's not the same as the dt, that little dt is uh, kind of contorted by this g function, right? They're not the same size. And in particular, there will be a factor that dt will be stretched out. And so uh, boring choice of words, but I'm going to call the factor by which it is stretched the stretching factor, right? So uh, don't forget to insert that stretching factor uh, so that we can uh, you know, have an accurate uh, representation of how the domain changes in that way. Okay, so that's the big idea. Now, uh, we started last time talking about how we might be able to rip off this idea in uh, two-dimensional context instead of one-dimensional. And so we're going to imagine that we have a function that takes two input variables and gives two output variables. U and V for inputs, X and Y for outputs, arbitrarily, won't always be like that, but just to have something to write with. Likewise, an integral on the right will pull back to an integral on the left, again, going backwards, right? And again, with the observation that, look, uh, this, uh, this size here, du, dv, and that size, you know, what you might call dx, dy, um, again, they're not the same, right? That function g will contort. Uh, it'll distort that area into a possibly bigger uh, little piece of area. And that stretching factor, you've got to make sure to remember to put that in there uh, as well. Um, so now, why is this a good thing? Right? Why would we want to bother with a sort of a substitution rule for double integrals. And the reason why is uh, looking at what we started with. Right? This integral right here, this domain, this set, being as it is an image of something else, it might be ugly. And this is actually a very common scenario. Uh, ugly domains are a thing. Right? So uh, the big win is that we can take a nasty domain like this that's just chock full of corners and uh, other related sort of uh, awkward issues. If you were to slice this up in the usual way, it's going to be a problem. Right? The new integral, when you do the pullback, the new integral will be defined on whatever your pullback domain is. In this case very conveniently just a rectangle. Right? So this is one of the big differences with uh, uh, the single variable version of this story where, I mean, what was our motivation to do this? I mean, why do we care about the substitution rule? It's because uh, this integrand might not be as nice and that integrand over there might be a better integrand. Right? The big challenge when you're doing single variable integration is ugly integrands. Very often, the big challenge when you're doing double integrals has nothing to do with the integrands. It's about the domains, right? So the 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 uh, the angle here, you know, the the reason this is a valuable tool is because it lets us turn a nasty integrand into a nice integrand. A, a domain. I'm sorry, I just said it. it. Allows us to turn a nasty domain into a nicer domain. Okay. Ah, right. So uh, now what is this stretching factor? Uh, I'm going to sweep the uh, demonstration under the rug for the moment. We've got a lot going on as it is, and I don't want to get distracted off into sort of formalities until we really know what kind of have. I want us to have a, 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 a 
comfortable ex sense and experience with uh, what we're doing here. And let's get let's get some in the win column before we worry about the details. But I claim that the stretching factor is going to always end up being the absolute value of the determinant of the derivative matrix. It's how it's going to turn out. Explanation will come later, as in later today, by the way. Um, okay, uh, so that's that's uh, optimistic. Today or Wednesday? Yeah, question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Um, uh, real quick reminder, uh, this is sometimes called a Jacobian matrix, and as such, this thing inside the absolute values is sometimes called the Jacobian determinant. Just FYI, a little terminology. Um, and another little interesting side note, this Jacobian determinant is sometimes written with this notation right there, um, <clears throat> which uh, looks weird at a glance. A lot of weird things about it. First of all, <laughs> there are two variables that it looks like you're taking partials with respect to two variables. And if you think about it, that actually does actually track pretty well with what we're looking at here. This matrix is made up of the partials of X and Y with respect to U and V. So, I mean, just in terms of how it rolls off the tongue, this really does make pretty good sense, I think, right? Here's another reason that this is handy. Um, as it turns out, uh, if I use this notation for this stretching factor, so I'm going to write this as, um, uh, oh, you know what, too small. Let me make this a little bigger. Uh, partial xy, partial uv. Don't forget your absolute values. And I'm multiplying that times uh, du dv. And let's not forget that the whole purpose is to help me understand this integral, which is an integral in the xy plane. And so I can think of that as representing dx dy. And with that noted, check it out. It's almost as if that and that cancel. Kind of. It certainly kind of looks that way anyway. Right? So this um, this notation here that's suggestive of this being a fraction, it, it, it's kind of nice. Uh, it, um, it, there are going to be situations where it's not clear uh, which of these, uh, you, whether you want partial xy, partial uv, or partial uv, partial xy. The fact that the fake nonsensical cancellation always goes the way that it should is very helpful. Now, I emphasize, this is nonsense. That is not a fraction. And it says so right here. Right? This thing is not a fraction. It's a determinant of a matrix. Determinants aren't fractions. So the, the suggestion that there's an actual cancellation there is absolute nonsense. Okay, but this is one of those situations where sometimes nonsensical notation can keep you on track in a very convenient way. So I'm a fan of that notation. I'm going to be using it a lot. Oh, yeah, question. Why does it work if it's nonsense? Life is good sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, ultimately the reason why is because uh, the, uh, the, the direction that this fake fraction is and the fact that it's like this and not that is keeping track of which of these variables is the inputs and which is the outputs, which is keeping track of which direction this function is going. And if the function's going the right direction, then life is good. And so it's basically, it's just a uh, uh, kind of a nice little alignment of convenient coincidences. That's all it is. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's do one. Oh, uh, before I do, let me clean up my mess. Get rid of that little math crime right there. Okay. Uh, and moving along. Um, this is a little bit of a manufactured example. One could argue this isn't very realistic. Um, we'll see some more realistic examples in a minute. Um, I want to do this example first because... Uh, it allows us to go through the motions and see how the process works and 
get one in the win column with as little effort as possible. Okay, so that said, um, here is what we start with. We're going to start with the unit square in the UV plane. Here it is. Given. Uh, we are then further given this function called G, for which you'll notice U and V are the inputs, and X and Y are the outputs. So going in the direction as indicated. We are then further told that the integral we're interested in, its domain is the image of that unit square by this function. In other words, the domain for my integral that I'm interested in is what comes out when you plug points in the unit square into this given g function. And so uh, it turns out, by the way, that that ends up looking something vaguely kind of like that. Okay, so that's our domain. And here, let me, uh, let me kind of erase all that stuff. That's the domain over which we want to do an integral. Now, it's uh, it's just a domain. I, you, know, you can totally just slice this up, I suppose. But let's take a moment to recognize how much that would stink, right, and how bad that would be. Uh, after all, there is a corner right there, and there is a corner right there. And so as you slice this up, you know, you're going to sort of feel like all's good until you hit that corner, at which point you're going to keep going and think everything's fine until you hit that corner, after which point you still got to keep going a little ways further to get to the end. So this would be three separate integrals, and we're already not happy, right? Everybody with me? Okay. It's worse than that, actually. Yeah, let me just get rid of all this. Uh, it's worse than that because if you ask, okay, well, yeah, but what are the equations of, let's say, this curve? <laughs> That's not given, you may notice, right? That curve we don't have as an equation. That curve is vaguely, in some sense, parametrized, right? Because I have x and y given as functions of u and v, and you could argue that maybe that edge comes from this edge where v is 1, and so you put kind of a 1 in those positions, and now you have x and y as functions of u. So you have a parametrization of the curve, not the equation. How do you solve for y as a function of x? That's another nasty little problem that we would have to deal with. So this is a nightmarishly difficult question if we were to come at it, you know, head on, just, you know, slicing in the X's and Y's directions. Okay. So what are we going to do instead? Let's look back up here to our change of variables strategy. The idea is if you have... A, uh, an integral, and if you want to pull back, you're going to need two things, notice. Uh, you're going to need to know uh, what is the function that makes our given ugly domain an image. I'm going to need to know that function. That's the function that's going to allow me to compute the stretching factor, so I need to know what that function is. And I'm also going to need to know what is my domain, the act, actually the image of, because that's going to be my domain for my new pullback integral, right? So it's all well and good to say I want to do a pullback, but you got to know what's your function and what's your pullback domain. So that's why this is actually a really nice first example here, because those are given, right? This was on purpose, but I set it up so that this is the pullback because that's the set whose image by that function is our, oops, uh, our, uh, our starting sort of, you know, problem domain. So, sweet. Bunch of freebies. All right. Okay, so um, what else do we need? Again, looking back to here, uh, I'm going to need to know my stretching factor. How am I going to compute my stretching factor? Well, we're going to follow this formula. We're going to write down the derivative matrix. We're going to take the determinant. We're going to take the absolute value. Is that cool? Okay. I forgot to turn my ringer off. Sorry about that. Let's get that off. 
Um, okay, <clears throat> so here we go. There's the function. I have to take the de derivative matrix. Uh, notice the derivative matrix says I need to take the u partials. Those are the u partials. Then I need to take the v partials. Those are the v partials. All right. uh, please do be careful not to accidentally transpose. Super easy to accidentally transpose your derivative matrix. Remember, input variables correspond to columns of the derivative matrix. Make sure to get that straight. Um, okay, that noted. Um, we take the determinant, nothing to it. Uh, fine and dandy. We re realize we have to take the absolute values. And here's where things get a little confusing. How do I know how to compute the absolute value of this expression for uv minus 9? Is this thing here positive? Is it negative? How do I know? One thing to keep in mind. We're only interested in that expression on our new domain. On our new domain, you can read right off of the diagram. I can see right here u is always between 0 and 1. The diagram tells me so. Right? And then likewise, I can see right off of the diagram v is also, in this case, always between 0 and 1. So with that in mind, now let's revisit this question. I've got to take the absolute value of this thing on the inside here. Well, 4uv is at most 4. So when I subtract 9, this expression I'm taking the absolute value of is at most negative 5. It's definitely negative. Its absolute value is the negative of itself. Is that cool? Okay, and we're in business. Uh, here's our new integral. Oh, uh, you know what? Let me, uh, let me do it like this. Uh, oh, I can also do that and make this a little bigger. There we go. Um, okay, so, yeah, we are now in business. Uh, we uh, just got through computing our stretching factor. Let's stick that in there before we forget it. Okay. we got to plug some stuff in. The plugging in is actually the easy part. Uh, x, what's x? Uh, how do I rewrite x in terms of u's and v's? Don't forget, x is explicitly given to us in that function. x is the first component of the change of variables function. You can see it right here in the picture as well. It is the first output coordinate from our g function. So that x is just this expression right there. And likewise, what is this y? How do I know what y is? Well, y is the second output from our change of variables function. y, therefore, is that expression right there. Everybody good? All right. Okay, so we're in business. Now, let, now let's, uh, let's ask the question. Was this a good choice? Did our lives become easier as a result of all of this? And there's a temptation to you know, say not so much, right? Because, I mean, this integral that I started with, look how nice that integrand is. It's just x plus y, super easy. And then I went and got it. Now it's all messed up. Now it's a quartic polynomial, and that, makes, that seems harder somehow, right? Um, but uh, that's a distraction. The big point here is that my domain here was nasty, right? Whereas my new integral, don't lose sight of what that new integral is. It's defined on my pullback domain, which is much nicer being as it is just a rectangle. It's a square, in fact, right? It's the unit square even. It's the world's best domain for a double integral. Zeros and ones is all it is. So this is a massive success. I started with a problem where I was going to have to break it up into three separate integrals on each of which I would have the nasty problem of 
trying to figure out the equations and therefore the bounds, this was a nightmare of a problem. Now I have a single integral on a rectangular domain. The worst thing I can say about it is that the polynomial has a fourth power in it. That's not problem, right? That's no big deal. It's a power rule, right? These are easy integrals. Massive win. Is everybody on board? Okay. All right. So that's uh, this is uh, kind of the process. This is how a change of variables works. Um, now. Uh, what do you use for your change of variables function? I, I confessed already this is a somewhat unnatural example in the sense that I just gave you the change of variables function. Most of the time in life, right, the change of variables function won't just be sitting there looking at you like this. Right? So how do you decide? And roughly speaking, you are going to decide what to use as a change of variables function by experience. So we're going to go through a bunch of them here, and I'm going to show you the clever choice in each of the following several examples. And, you know, try to choose analogously, right, depending on the situations that come up. You will have been down certain roads and then it, whatever question you find yourself facing, you can just think, okay, which one does this look the most like? And that's suggestive of where to go. Okay, that said, um, do notice that there is a backwardsness uh, to all of this. So, for example, if, you, if your change of variables function is a counterclockwise rotation, the punchline is that in the pullback, that will rotate things clockwise. because it's a pullback, right? Because everything is going backwards. And again, just keep in mind, the function um, the function goes what you might call forward, and then the integral, and therefore the domain over which I'm computing my new integral, goes backwards. So there's always an oppositeness of sorts. And let's, uh, let's see that in action. Uh, we'll uh, look at this example here. Uh, now, I am going to leave some of the setup of this as a little geometry exercise for you all to work out for yourselves. I claim that uh, this square with these given corners looks like this, and in particular, that that is, in fact, a square. So something to think through, right? Persuade yourself. It's, like I say, a good little vector algebra problem. That they, how would you convince uh, somebody who doesn't believe you that this actually is a square. <coughs> ah, excuse me. Mm. Okay, <clears throat> that having been settled, um, <clears throat> I've got to now come up with a choice for a pullback domain and a change of variables function such that this is the resulting image. Right. So, um, <coughs> oh my gosh, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. So here's what I claim. I claim that I can use this square of side length 2 and that my change of variables function can be a counterclockwise rotation. <coughs> All right, so uh, you think about this nice sort of, you know, uh, aligned, nice square here. And if you rotate it counterclockwise, as indicated by these purple arrows, then that will give you this tilted square that is our actual domain. So, so our domain, as required now, is the image, by a, by a function that we're going to establish in a second here, it's the image of a better domain that we will eventually call our pullback domain. Is that cool? All right, now, that said, we're, we're going to write down the formulas for that, uh, for that function. But now notice how the pullback works. The pullback process is going to allow me to turn an integral on this blue domain into an integral <laughs> on the orange domain. Right? And <clears throat> what do you do to this blue domain to make it look like that orange domain? Well, you have to rotate it clockwise. Right? So a counterclockwise rotation pulls back 
in a kind of a clockwise manner. Okay, cool. So let's think about this counterclockwise, uh, mm, excuse me, rotation. Y'all will recall um, from uh, very early on in the course that um, you know there's a bunch of stuff from linear algebra we are going to assume, and I know that some of it might have been a little rusty for you, and I've pointed out this is something that y'all do have to make sure that you're good with, right? We talked through some of it, uh, linear transformations. Oh, whoops, sorry, purple. Uh, linear transformations are represented by matrices. Uh, matrices can be understood by their columns. The columns are the images of the standard basis vectors, all that business, right? And applying that to a nice linear transformation, like a rotation here, uh, you can persuade yourself that this is going to be the formula for how to do that counterclockwise rotation. Make sure that you can do that. Um, if you're uncomfortable with some of that stuff, come to office hours. We'll be very happy to talk you through it. Um, Ask a friend, go to the office hours of the other instructors, right? You've got various options, the, the help room, et cetera, right? So find the resource that you can sit down and spend some time with and make sure that you're comfortable. We are going to assume that you can do that uh, on exams and stuff. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So that uh, noted, uh, I'll also point out that this angle... Whoops, bad colored choice. Uh, this angle right here from the geometry of the picture is pi over 6, and you plug in pi over 6, and you'll find that then this is the matrix. Or said differently, here is the formula for the linear transformation that turns U's and B's into X's and Y's. And I'm sorry for this splotch right there on top. That looks weird. So that's not part of, that's not part of the, the, uh, the notes, of course. Okay, everybody good? Okay, so uh, we're in business. We have ourselves a change of variables function. We have our pullback domain. All we have to do is compute our stretching factor and start plugging stuff in. And so, okay, here, let's compute the stretching factor. Um, Got to take the U partials. And take the V partials. Uh, keep in mind that uh, x is this dot product, right? And y is uh, this dot product. And so you can uh, multiply that out and take the appropriate partials and get that derivative matrix and take the determinant and all together, after it's all said and done, that stretching factor is one. Which seems like a weird coincidence when you look at all the algebra involved. But then if you, uh, you know, step back and remind yourself geometrically, after all, we're just talking about a rotation here. Rotations don't change areas, right? Rotations are rigid motions. Areas don't get stretched at all. If they don't get stretched at all, then the stretching factor really ought to be one. So this is uh, not a weird coincidence. What are the odds? This is, well, of course it is. Is that satisfying? All right. <clears throat> okay, it's all over with the shouting. Uh, stretching factor, don't forget the absolute values. Easy to forget the absolute values. Got to put that in. Uh, let's see here. What are we going to do with, uh, how do I compute X? Wait, where do, uh, where's my formula for X? What's going on there? Don't forget, X is the first output from our function. As previously discussed, it's that dot product. So X is just this. Right, and likewise, y, what is this y thing? How do I find y? Well, it's the second output, and therefore it's that dot product, which is that. Is that cool? All right, so again, let's take stock. You know, was this a useful exercise? Did we, uh, did this make our lives easier? Uh, tempting to say it's not that helpful. I mean, after all, we pr started off this process with a nice, easy little integrand and everything. 
The problem was that our domain is chock full of corners, right? No matter how you slice this up, you're going to be hitting multiple corners, right? So for example, you're going to hit these two corners when you slice like this and then uh, like that and then uh, like that for the remainder. So uh, yeah, there's three separate integrals that you'd have to crank out to compute that one. And not only would you have three separate integrals, you'd have to find the equations for these lines. Not that that's hard, but there'd be fractions and square roots and stuff in the slopes, just ever so slightly annoying. Uh, whereas this integral here that we've turned it into on our pullback domain, our pullback domain was a nice lined up square, constant bounds, no funny business. Easy integral. Is everybody happy? So another big win. All right. Okay, uh, a couple of little uh, things that have to get said. Uh, we're not going to worry uh, about this too much in this course, but uh, in order for uh, uh, formalities to be okay, uh, <clears throat> the change of variables function does have to be continuously differentiable. So that's just, you know... Like I say, it's not going to be an issue for us. Um, but also, just you know, uh, just so you don't actually step on a landmine at some point in your future, the change of variables function has to be invertible. And the reason for that, let me go back to if I can get this thing to behave. Here we go. The reason it has to be invertible is the whole idea was that we start with a domain, we look at its image. And then we argue that an integral on the image can be pulled back to an integral on the pre-image. And this kind of, in order to know that when you go forward and back, that you actually get the exact same set, that only works if the function's invertible. Otherwise, you're going to have multiplicity problems. Weird things are going to happen that's uh, not going to, um, it's just not going to work out correctly. So the function has to be invertible. Uh, again, not going to be much of an issue for us, but I feel like it needs to get said. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> here's another uh, uh, idea that's going to be really useful for us, um, and that is if you have a change of variables function and a corresponding stretching factor, what if you were to go the other way? What if instead of viewing x and y as functions of u and v, what if u and v were functions of x and y? And what's the stretching factor for that other backwards change of variables function? Right? And um, we have a notation to represent these stretching facts. Always the partials of the outputs with respect to the inputs. Notice down here, it looks like we flipped it, right? But in fact, all this is, is the partials of the outputs. U and V are now our outputs. Partials of the outputs with respect to the, what are now the inputs, X and Y, going that way. X and Y are now our inputs, right? So uh, what's the relationship between these? Now, before I show you the a reasonable argument on this, if I can get this thing to behave, um, there is a temptation to look at this expression and that expression and say, oh yeah, this is a fraction. And fractions you could just, you know, you flip and that's the same as a reciprocal and so these must be reciprocals of each other. And that is a nonsense argument. Because as we discussed previously, that's not actually a fraction. This is kind of a notational crime. We're drawing it like a fraction because in one context it behaves like a fraction in that one context. That doesn't mean it's actually a fraction. It is not. It is a determinant and that we certainly can't just conclude that it just behaves like a fraction in general. Right? So you can't that, that does not hold water. Um, but here's what you can argue, and this is perfectly reasonable. You can say, well, if I have a set over here, and if I look at its image over here, whatever that might happen to look like, um, going from this 
set, looking at its image, everything gets all stretched out. And now if I subsequently go back the other direction, I know I'm going to get the exact same set. Over and back, invertible function, exactly the same set results. So altogether, the stretching factor for the whole process is clearly 1, and that means that the product of the blue stretching factor and the green stretching factor has to be that same overall stretching factor, namely 1. And that means that these are reciprocals of each other. Like so. Does that make sense to everybody? Nice little, nice little conclusion. So it's not true because of the notation. It's that the notation is plausible because this is true. The arrows go opposite the direction a lot of people think. Okay. All right, so armed with that, we go on to our next example. It turns out that uh, what we just saw is actually going to be really useful here. And uh, how are we on time? Uh, we, oh, we're good. Okay. Um, so this is a weird example. There's a fair amount of setup that goes into this. Um, so bear with me <laughs> while we set this up. Uh, okay, so here we go. Uh, we have four curves. Four curves, about like this. Um, R, our domain, is the region that's bounded by those curves. So it's this thing kind of uh, in the middle here. It's, uh, you know, whatever that is. I don't know how to describe that shape. Um, and let's suppose that we want to do an integral on this region for some reason. Right? Now, you may be thinking to yourselves, okay, highly manufactured, super unnatural, what does this have to do with anything, right? Where would this ever come up in an engineering situation? Come on, what are the odds? And, uh, well, here's where it came from. I'll tell you exactly where I got this example from. Um, way back when, when I was taking thermodynamics, uh, it turns out that when you're studying something called the Carnot cycle, and any of your engineers are going to eventually see this, uh, when you're studying the Carnot cycle, this shape, not exactly this. I've changed the numbers to make it a little bit easier to deal with, the, just superficially, right? But basically, this shape is extremely important in understanding the Carnot cycle, which is a fundamentally important concept in thermodynamics. So if you're an engineer, you're going to totally see shapes like this. That's a very naturally arising, real, and important shape, believe it or not. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, with that in mind, how do we do an integral on this shape? Now, the obvious first point to make is we're going to hit a lot of corners, right? So, if we, uh, if we slice it in the usual way, we'll have to deal with that region, and then we'll subsequently have to deal with that region, and then we will subsequently have to deal with this region just because of those corners. Obviously, we don't want to have to do three separate integrals when we don't have to. Okay. So, here's the move. Very clever move that I did not think of myself. Somebody showed me this right now. I'm showing you. So, we're all copying. You know, you trace it back. We're all copying whoever was the first person <laughs> to do this. Very clever idea. Step one, take your equations that you're given that describe the four curves. Make sure they're written as level sets. So, you're going to notice here equals constant, equals constant, equals constant, equals constant. It turns out to be important to the, the, the wacky little trick that we're about to pull. So uh, now these equations might have come at you differently, right? You look at this equation here, x, y equals 1. That could have come to you as y equals 1 over x. Don't leave it like that. You shuffle things around so that it's stuff equals constant. Okay, that said... Next step, um, the function, two of whose level sets are two of my curves, call that u. This other function, two of whose level sets are two of our curves, 
Call that V. So what, uh, what is this bias? Well, now do notice that that gives us a change of variables function, right? That U and V are functions of X and Y. Now you could very reasonably call this a backwards change of variables function, right? I, uh, I want to do a pullback, uh, but I want the pullback to take the domain that I have and give me the domain that I want. Uh, and this is going the wrong direction, but that pulling back would go the, this way. Which, uh, which isn't what I want, right? So this is an awkwardly backwards um, uh, function, but do check this out. Pretty neat. This curve right here has this equation, xy equals 1, and of course xy is just u, and so that curve, xy equals 1, becomes just u equals 1. It becomes a straight vertical line in the UV plane. And so you see now why it was important that we be looking at level sets. Uh, this is a, a level set means that there's a that what eventually will become my new variable is going to equal to a constant and thus a nice desirable line. And so likewise for the other curves, they become the other straight lines over there. And grand total altogether, uh, by way of this function, um, let's see here, this domain corresponds to this domain. And of course, there's a lot of potential for awesome here because you know we hate this domain here, corners and ugly and three different intervals and yikes. And uh, this uh, domain over here, rectangle, awesome, bounds are constant, nothing to it. How we doing? Is everybody with me so far with the setup? Okay, so uh, let's compute the Jacobian determinant. Now, uh, keep in mind, we have here U and V as functions of x and y, we can take the uh, whoops. We can take the x partials, and we can take the y partials. And there's um, in our uh, derivative matrix, take the determinant, and you get your Jacobian determinant uh, right here. And I'm going to confess that I'm a little confused. Because, wait a minute, our functions go in the wrong way. So, wait a second, when I pull back, is this the, is this the stretch or is this the, Am I squishing by this factor or am I stretching? It's confusing, right? Which way does it go, right? So, this is one of the reasons that I love the notation that I introduced here, this kind of vaguely fractional notation, because here's what we're eventually going to need. Uh, I know that I'm going to want to turn an xy integral into a uv integral. That's the whole point to this change of variables. The whole point is that I want to get rid of x's and y's, and I want a new integral that's in terms of u's and v's, and so I want to get du dv. So I need to figure out how to rewrite dx dy as something times du dv. And what should this be? And which uh, partials of what with respect to what? Well, nonsensical though it is, the fact that this f fake cancellation always guides you in the correct direction, very handy for making me realize that, yeah, this is the one I need. I need partial xy, partial uv, because that's what allows me to rewrite dx dy in this way. Is that cool? And with that in mind... Um, <clears throat> let's see here. So, uh, yeah, so I need partial xy, partial uv. It is the reciprocal of the partial uv, partial xy that we just computed. And thus, my stretching factor, whoops. Ah. Thus, my stretching factor is... 1 over xy squared. What do you think? Everybody all right? 
All right. So, yeah, I really like this notation. I, I, it's very helpful. The notation here uh, has done some bookkeeping for us. Let it, right? You might as well let it do some thinking for you. It's very handy. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to do on this example, you can see we are basically done here. We've got a UV integral. We've got our UV bounds. Those UV bounds, of course, just come from the picture, which comes from that picture, which comes from these equations, right? We trace it all back. Um, the awkward thing is, uh, what am I supposed to do with this? I've got an expression involving x's and y's. Uh, and I need to, I need that in terms of u's and v's. Now, in uh, previous examples, mm, excuse me. in previous examples, we would have said, hey, nothing to it. We have formulas for y and x. And just plug those in. That was the plugging in is easy aspect of our previous examples. x equals stuff, just put it in there, no thought required. Um, reminder, problem here, we don't have that. Right? Our function is going the wrong way, you might say. Um, I don't know what x is, and I don't know what y is. Let's set aside the fact that I know y'all are really good at algebra. I know y'all can solve for x and y in this system of equations. Uh, yes, yeah, sometimes you get lucky and you can do that. Let's try to uh, establish how would you deal with this situation if you couldn't, because sometimes you can't solve for x and y. Right? So here's the trick. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, that's the, not a good choice of words. H here's the strategy that, that you can hopefully make work. Um, I notice that I have an expression involving x's and y's. I notice that specifically it is a product of powers of x and y. Um, I want to write it in terms of u, which is a product of powers of x and y, and v, which is a product of powers of x and y. Now, again, just thinking out loud here, uh, I want to make this product of powers out of these products of powers. So, thinking out loud, what should we do to products of powers to produce a different product of powers. And, and now I'm going to make a guess here, and I emphasize that this is a guess. It seems like a reasonable thing to try would be to take a product of powers <laughs> of my products of powers, because I'm pretty sure that at least has a chance of producing the desired product of powers. Right, so it's a total guess. It's a total wild guess. Wild, this may be not a wild guess, but it's a guess. I don't know that this is going to work, but it seems like a reasonable thing to try. I mean, I'm pretty sure that the way I'm going to turn green and blue into orange probably not going to have anything to do with um, hyperbolic cosecant. Probably, right? What I just kind of look at it and tell it's not. That doesn't have much of a chance. So we try this because it seems like it has a chance of working out. And having made that guess, uh, the algebra actually works out really nicely in this case. Um, you can just kind of multiply that out. Uh, notice that now I have two expressions that are equal, and therefore the x coefficient, excuse me, the x exponents have to be equal, and the y exponents have to be equal. And then I can just solve for A and B. And therefore, I get what I need. And that's what allows me then, uh, let's see here. That is what allows me to rewrite that in terms of U and V. So uh, <clears throat> in general, um, yeah, I don't have a single you know, this will always work type algorithm for dealing with this. Uh, but what I can say is that if you make reasonable guesses, you can usually put the pieces together and make it work in a reasonable way. Um, and of course, you know, I'll, you know I'm not going to ask you to answer a question on exams where reasonable approaches won't work, right? So somehow or another, something like this will work out. Okay, see y'all later. Have a good uh, rest of your Monday.